Okay, let's continue. Uh, so now we're talking about API for I.O. Now I.O. system calls would uh, encapsulate device behaviors in a more generic way so that hopefully you don't have to learn too many different APIs just to work with different devices. And in fact, you might even be able to uh, abstract away details of uh, exactly how many devices you have or different kinds of devices. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that would be very desirable because imagine what if you have to use a different API just to work with each brand of uh, disk. So Seagate might use one uh, call and then uh, Western Digital, you have to use a different call. That, that would not be very good. So, so you want to these uh, device uh, APIs to be mostly um, generic or general for um, the, at least application programmers. And any detail you want to isolate in the device, uh, the device driver layer. And what if there's new devices? Well, hopefully you should be able to reuse a lot of the uh, already implemented protocols with a little or no extra work. And, and so each OS would define its own framework for uh, these I.O. subsystem structure and device drivers. Now, uh, there's different device uh, types, uh, device I.O. So we talked about like a character stream versus a block device. So that's based on uh, uh, data transfer mode. Character stream will be one byte at a time. Could be your keyboard, your terminal, uh, modem. Uh, block device would be one whole block at a time. So for example, your disk, a flash card, and so forth, and network cards too. Uh, access method, uh, maybe sequential or random access. So sequential would be one where data just keeps coming and streaming in. So your webcam, modem, network card, uh, you, you have take care of buffering, uh, but you just, it just come, comes in uh, sequentially. Compared to random access, it's more like a memory device. It could be your CD-ROM, your USB drive, hard drive. Um, and the transfer schedule could be asynchronous or synchronous. So synchronous is, uh, is one that's on the, you might call, a, a, a has a, a, some regular behavior to them. So your display refreshes at a fixed rate, or uh, your uh, tape drive, um, it spins at a certain rate. But asynchronous would be like, uh, you don't know when the next event's gonna come in, so the mouse, keyboard, these would be asynchronous transfer. Now sharing uh, could be that uh, you may have a device that's shareable among several processes. So for example, keyboard, right? Uh, very rarely do you have devices that are dedicated to just a single process. So a keyboard, camera, microphone, speaker, right? these are, um, let's call it shareable among several processes. Now, uh, some uh, may be dedicated in the sense that uh, for the given moment, uh, while well, one process is using, it's locking out everybody else. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're doing printing, um, yes, it actually the prints, uh, the, the process that's doing the printing, you, you can think of it as uh, locking that uh, for the duration or if you're using tape drive copying, then uh, that's usually not shared among uh, several processes for the given moment, okay? There's also the different speed classes uh, and different aspects of speed in terms of latency, seek time, transfer rate, delay between operations. Uh, the direction of I.O. could be rewrite, read-only, write-only. So what would be write-only? Well, write-only would be like uh, output device. Could be speaker, graphics controller, any other actuator. Um, some may be read-only, so your ROM, CD-ROM, um, and rewrite would be like a, a magnetic disk, flash memory. So kernel I.O. structure may look something like this. So you have the kernel, but underneath you have the I.O. subsystem. Why? These are even closer to hardware, right? And so they need uh, part of the code that talks to the hardware and that's a device driver. So the, this layer, uh, bottom layer of blue, I hope you can see color, um, up to, so the, the center row there um, is all driver, right? SAS device driver, keyboard device driver, mouse device driver, all these drivers, USB device driver. 
and then um, below which you actually have hardware. So there's a co corresponding controller that the driver is talking to. And the controller is really the interface between the host on one side and the controller or the device uh, on the other side. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, the uh, usual uh, way of viewing the kernel I.O. structure. Now, uh, these characteristics of I.O. devices may vary, and the device drivers handles the, the, the differences. Um, and um, now, these broadly I.O. devices can be grouped uh, by the OS into block I.O., character I.O., or stream, um, memory map file access, and network sockets. <coughs> and um, hopefully you can do a uniform interface like the read or write uh, call, but sometimes you uh, may have to do a specific control for the de uh, device. So in Unix, there's a call called IOCTO or IO control, uh, IOCTL, that's really short for IO control. That is that API for doing a device-specific kind of control, register, uh, rewrite. Okay. So uh, then that uh, tends to be very device-specific, and um, but that is that uh, interface when you need it uh, to send device-specific commands. Now, uh, block and character devices, uh, so you would be reading or writing a whole block at a time. And if it's a random access, you even support seek. Seek lets you jump to a certain point. Uh, and also, there's different modes of I.O. So you could do what's called raw I.O. or a direct I.O. or maybe even a file system kind of I.O. And uh, memory mapped file uh, is another way, although uh, I'm not going to cover it. It's in, in this chapter if you're interested in reading more about it. And uh, so with character devices, you could do individual um, uh, characters with uh, get and put commands. Um, and, but these don't necessarily go directly with a device, every single transfer. There's, um, line buffering as well. So, like if you program in Python, for example, right, and, you, and use raw input and you ask the user to type in something, every key you type, well, it doesn't necessarily go uh, directly to the device, or every character that's sent, it doesn't actually go to your process. The OS actually takes your line buffering, and then that's what allows you to do like editing on that same line. So you can backspace and then go use the arrow key to go to different uh, parts, insert, delete, and then you hit enter, and that's when uh, that whole line gets uh, a handle, uh, taken over um, and then uh, sent to the device. Okay, so uh, there's different layers possible uh, in front of uh, the, the, these uh, block and character. And of course, you can turn this off. So for example, if you're do running Vim or other um, the editor, text editor in text mode, then uh, yeah, it, it actually, uh, every key uh, is reflected um, and there's no line buffering. Now, with uh, network devices, it's a little different than um, what's called block and character devices. Why? Because these connections are dynamic, right? So, um, for example, I mean, you keyboard, you, I mean, nowadays you have uh, plug and play, and so yes, that it could actually be, uh, be something that you assume uh, to exist, but still, it, it um, may not. It may be uh, plugged in after you start, but still, the API can isolate you uh, to a large extent. So, for example, if you're trying to uh, read from the keyboard, keyboard hasn't been plugged in, OS uh, just simply doesn't give you anything until you plug in the keyboard and you don't even, the program doesn't even see that, right? And then once you start typing, yes, you get that. But uh, for network devices, it's different because you're connecting to something else, right? A remote host. And, and so you need a way to figure out how many connections do I have that's active. Right. And in fact, you, one process may be talking, uh, may be handling several different uh, connections. And so with a socket interface, that allows you to uh, establish multiple connections over the network, over TCP IP, for example. Uh, and so to do this, you need a different kind of API. And in this case, uh, select 
will be or one example that makes it more efficient. So instead of just uh, reading or writing, which may be blocking call or kind of half blocking call, they, um, in other words, uh, so reading, writing, they may be um, one that does kind of the best effort. So well, whatever I have, I just uh, get or send and then return right away uh, without fully blocking. Uh, with a select, it actually can uh, take care of multiple of these um, um, sockets. And uh, they, sometimes they may be waiting. And then this interface allows you uh, to then uh, get or the socket that has a packet waiting to be received or uh, to be sent. That way uh, it takes care of the, um, the checking for you so you don't need to do the polling or busy waiting, especially for this kind of uh, socket type of structure dynamically established. So the uh, network devices API would look a little different than so it's just your regular keyboard and uh, uh, disk type of thing. Okay, and the approaches can vary widely depending on if you're using pipes, FIFO, queues, mailboxes, and so forth. Now clocks and timers, you can think of these as, as some kind of devices too. And in fact, you could actually use what's called an RTC, or real-time clock chip. Um, and uh, that's another I.O. device, except it keeps the time and it can, uh, you can set an alarm, just like an alarm clock. And so you deal with it like a device, except you know it just uh, increments on it counts time on its own. Uh, now clocks and timers are a little different in the sense that um, a timer would just count cycles, and uh, clocks would uh, maybe if it's real time clock, it may even have a calendar. It knows the month, year, day, and all that. And uh, in addition to the wall clock. So uh, depending on what interface it is, still you'd like to have a, um, uh, an, uh, some uniform interface, but th this tends to be a little bit uh, harder in the sense that uh, the, your clock resolution uh, may be more limited. Uh, and uh, also there's the delay uh, from the time uh, the, the interrupt service routine gets interrupt to the time the user code gets controlled. Because here we're talking about API for the application program, okay? So, um, you, so there's a couple of different ways. Uh, the Unix, um, well Unix provides a couple APIs. One is Signal we talked about a little earlier. Uh, Signal gives you that interface to timers and other events. Um, IOCTL, as mentioned a few slides ago, is uh, for I.O. control, so that way you can um, use this to uh, deal with the, the more specific aspects of the clock and timers. And a lot of OSs also support the network time protocol um, so that uh, it can get the, the current time over the network over from uh, uh, the time server. Um, and it, but then there's a latency on network, so the NTP actually can handle the network latencies and it can be pretty sophisticated to, to give you a fairly accurate uh, uh, clock setting. Okay, now um, in terms of um, blocking, non blocking, asynchronous, those are terms are a little different from before. So, blocking is what you expect. So, you make a call. It doesn't return until the I.O. is completed. So that's the most straightforward API, easy to understand, but at the same time more limiting because while uh, the call hasn't returned, you can't do anything else. Uh, you might spawn a thread to do something, but then that's only if you have a kernel thread to run this other thread. Okay? Now, if it's non-blocking, that means uh, uh, it's kind of the best effort. So it returns whatever you have at the moment uh, as much as possible, um, and then, uh, but then it might not be uh, everything you're requesting. For example, the Unix uh, read and write, right? So these could be uh, done as uh, non blocking in the sense that, say, if I want to read, I specify a maximum, say, I want to read 2K, but uh, what's in the buffer is only maybe 20 bytes. What happens? Does it wait till 2K? No, it actually doesn't. It uh, says, oh, 20 bytes, I'll take what 20 bytes. So it returns until you, I just read 20 bytes, even though you asked me to read 2K, okay? So that would be an example of non-blocking. 
I/O. So it returns as much as it can without blocking. <laughs> That's what that means. And the writing is the same. Okay. Um, and asynchronous uh, means the the process uh, runs while the I/O executes. Okay. So uh, that is um, more like I register a call, but it doesn't tell me how much is done. You need a separate call just to find out, well, tell me the progress, uh, how much have you written or read, and, and so forth. Okay, so asynchronous is a little uh, trickier, um, and, uh, but then it's supposed to be the, the more efficient way to do things because then there's more it can uh, do there to, to optimize and, uh, and uh, to schedule. So the IO the subsystem, uh, can do a signal, uh, so that way there's a notification, or you can just keep polling. Um, but then this polling is not uh, the at the device driver level. This is more um, above the API, so the user co uh, code would uh, uh, make system call to check. Um, okay, so now synchronous versus asynchronous it would be like uh, here user. Uh, makes a request, goes down to device driver, and then uh, blocks until uh, it finishes, comes back. Okay, so in, in, during this time, it's all waiting. Whereas asynchronous, you make the call return right away and while the I.O. progresses, and then uh, upon completion, um, then uh, a notification comes. Uh, and of course, you know, there's different uh, OS level API it could be in the form of this. A signal call and then it registers a call back to you because user doesn't specify interrupt service return. User can get a call back as a notification, okay? and that can be done in the case of asynchronous. Okay, um, now vectored I/O. Um, so is it would be one where uh, you think uh, in terms of array of commands. Uh, so instead of one system call and then you do one thing, uh, oftentimes it takes multiple operations to finish one uh, task at the user level, right? So for example, if you want um, to say, let's deal, deal with a disk. So to do write, you may, uh, or flash, right? So you may have to um, read out, erase, and write, make the change right, right? So there, there's actually a sequence of these operations. So do you really want the, um, to, to, as an OS, to provide separate calls for these? Or uh, it's more like a script, right? So vector IO, you can think of it as a script. You send uh, via one system call and one system kernel, um, the kernel takes over and in fact gives that script to the device uh, driver to run. Um, and or device driver can you know, send, send this to uh, the I/O controller to run uh, to finish that uh, sequence. So that's how SCSI works. So SCSI, you don't just give it a single low-level command at a time. You can uh, just give a sequence uh, or array of commands or a block of commands, whatever the term is. So it basically just does them in a sequence. Okay. So think of them as multiple. Um, I/O operations all batched up you know, via one system call. That way, it doesn't even context switch. Or it doesn't have to switch back and forth. Most switch between user mode, uh, kernel mode, several times. It says, "I know these are the things I'm gonna do, and so don't bother coming back until you finish this batch of uh, operations." Okay, so uh, and this is also called scatter scatter uh, method. It's much better than in multiple individual I/O calls because it eliminates or it decreases the switching um, between the system and uh, the user code. And also uh, saves unnecessary user context switching. Okay? And uh, of course, you want some automicity in there. What does that mean? That means uh, you, you don't want to do this halfway. You want it more all or nothing type of thing. Right? So, um, so you want them to uh, do, if, if I give you, a, uh, the, if, if I make a batch type of, or vector I.O. call, then I want them to all execute the completion before getting notified. 
Okay, so the next topic is kernel I.O. subsystem. And so now kernel I.O. subsystem a lot of times does require uh, scheduling uh, just to consider the characteristics of different I.O. speeds, seek rotational latency, transfer rate, uh, the types. Okay, scheduling becomes more important. So FIFO usually doesn't uh, work out as well. And you've seen a few cases uh, before. And so now you, you uh, want to divide them at least into different uh, speed classes and different uh, in queues, uh, different requests. Uh, and then uh, maybe be able to reorder them, uh, prioritize them, and so forth. And oftentimes these devices are measured in terms of some kind of a quality of service, okay, QoS. And so that means you do need to track the different uh, the, the status of different devices uh, as they run in some data structure. And this data structure is called device status table. And so here is an illustration. So in this case, you have one device, uh, keyboard status idle and laser printer is busy. And then you have a link list for the chain of uh, requests. Could be for the different uh, user jobs and so forth. And then there are other devices like mouse, maybe idle. This one is idle. This two may be busy. And it has already the queued up uh, requests there. Uh, to access a file and other files, uh, whether it's read or write operation, the addresses and links and other status information. And kernel does buffering, and so we saw a little bit of that earlier. And it needs to do buffering. Why? Because um, they, well, for one is to account for the speed differences between devices, or, or between whoever is producing and consuming. Right? And um, also the, the, the different uh, transfer sizes. Uh, you may need to do, uh, if it's larger than the native uh, size, you may have to packetize and uh, put sequence numbers in there um, and so forth. Right? So, uh, it's, and also we may need to do uh, additional uh, uh, checking, uh, re reordering of these packets, uh, reassembling them. Uh, so first for speed match. Right. So uh, think of it this way. So if you have uh, received data on modem and you want to save to disk, what do you do? Modem is sending one byte at a time, and it's relatively slow compared to disk. Modem um, tops maybe uh, 50, uh, some thousand um, baud, right? and that's not very fast. That's serial port speed compared to disk. So every byte that comes in from the modem, do you, if you want to save to disk, you just save one byte, that would be very inefficient. Much better if you buffer it up to at least one block, and then write the whole block to disk. Right? So uh, that is the better way to do it. Um, but then, depending on how you do it, like we talked about kernel buffering, uh, you may do what's called double, bu double buffering. And what that means is uh, you, there's the um, user side doing the buffering and then kernel in order to make it work with the kernel space then the kernel side the API behind the API copies from kernel, the user buffer to kernel buffer or vice versa and so that's additional work just to move data um, so what are the solutions well so we well, want to be able to do some um, um, mapping but other times you actually have more things to be scheduling um, and so for example if you're doing display for example anybody take in graphics uh, you probably know the concept of double buffering that's actually uh, a, a feature rather than a problem you want to um, eliminate why because what you want to do is to allow um, the, uh, the display to render uh, and uh, while the processor or the graphics card would be able to uh, to build up the next frame. Otherwise, what happens is then you see partially built up uh, drawing uh, if it doesn't run in a synchronized way. So uh, double buffering allows the producer and consumer to be simultaneously working without uh, having to lock each other out. 
uh, and uh, they would do it at a um, in their own granularity. So that way, it's much more efficient, and you don't have to um, be uh, using semaphore locking because you actually are not sharing the same memory region. So you're using different uh, frames, and and it can also make it a better uh, viewing experience because there's no jitter while uh, you're viewing a, a frame that's being built up. You, that way it's a lot less efficient or a lot less desirable. You don't want to see partially rendered image. You want the image to be completely rendered before you switch buffer and then display. And so once it's display, it's, uh, it's showing what it's supposed to show as opposed to only partially rendered uh, image. Okay, so here is a plot from the book for different uh, interface speeds. Um, so keyboard is very slow on this end. Uh, so probably 10 characters per second max, um, and hard to type much faster than that. Compared to that PCI Express, um, depending on the generation, right? So there's uh, the 3 by 8, 3 by 16. So you're uh, you know in the range of 16 gigabytes. Uh, per second. So that's a big difference. Right? So buffering for different uh, transfer sizes, so for example network, uh, you, well network card has its own buffer size, a lot like how disks uh, do, but TCP IP packet would be much larger, so 64k of TCP IP. That's uh, for the network level, but Ethernet uh, packet is um, 1500 bytes. So that means each TCP IP packet would then be uh, expressed in terms of um, uh, the, no, dozen, several dozen uh, Ethernet packets. And so then how do you then uh, know the, the size? Um, so you, this you, it depends on the protocol because you can you know, packetize the application data to IP packets for TCP IP or over Ethernet or um, uh, you know, the other way would be assemble Ethernet packets into IP packets. Uh, maybe you need to do some reordering uh, for them to work. Um, and so sometimes you just have to work with uh, the native buffer size of the device. Other times it's uh, the protocol defined uh, size. Um, copy semantics would mean uh, if you say uh, pass a buffer to write and the buff well that by definition is user space because you're writing user level code right and you want the uh, write to be able to return before the IO completes so what happens well and you think well I already wrote so then I'm gonna go ahead and modify the buff but then the write goes out pretty slowly right so uh, what if the write hasn't gone out and you went ahead and modified the buff, right? So that becomes a problem, okay? So then, so the, the semantic would be that, well, as soon as you've returned from the function, uh, the snapshot you passed in should be what I, what's actually written out eventually. It sh so that later after the, the function returns, if uh, you go ahead and modify buff, it doesn't really matter because that already has been captured. But then that means uh, you, strictly speaking, you uh, would uh, have to uh, do cop uh, copying of the content from the buff before you return, and that can be wasteful. So, well, um, copy on write comes to the rescue, uh, so that uh, that's what kernel can do. Market as um, a part where if the user attempts to make a modification, then um, it's uh, it's uh, copied, right? So they can do lazy copying that way and um, make the copy semantics more efficient. So it doesn't do unnecessary copying. Now, kernel IO can also do its own caching, and this caching would be OS level caching as opposed to the uh, hardware um, caching or processor level caching. So this is different from buffering in the sense that uh, caching is always uh, uh, optional in that because it's the redundant copy, okay? And so that is uh, it, that means if it's not there, it just works more slow, 
lower performance. Uh, so it should work without caching, whereas buffering is a slightly different concept. Okay, um, and so uh, now, so caching um, can. It should be done uh, basically by OS transparent to the user awareness. Whereas buffering, the application program uh, would be aware of it. Um, it wouldn't be aware of uh, any caching done by the OS. And uh, but uh, caching could also be uh, combined with buffering. Um, and so uh, we've seen some cases when we talk about these uh, disks in the sense that uh, you, uh, the kernel would, uh, would have uh, these buffers it maintains and uh, instead of um, freeing them, you could just um, track them and mark them as uh, potentially reclaimable uh, but then if uh, it, what, what's needed is in there, it actually goes back to the uh, free uh, list and then you know, gets that from there. So that's an example of buffering combined with uh, caching. So there is really to avoid the physical I.O. by taking advantage of content that's already in memory. Okay, there are uh, two more concepts. One is called spooling and the other is device reservation. Uh, spooling is a way of holding output for a device possibly on disk, possibly in memory, um, so that uh, the, it allows these, uh, the, these processes to be able to uh, continue doing useful thing while the, uh, the I.O. request is uh, pending. So this is uh, most commonly used for uh, devices where it, uh, the device can take only one request at a time. So for example, printing is the typical example. A lot of times when you try to print a job, what happens? Well, you get this uh, window that pops up and says, okay, well, this printer has this, uh, this job, uh, several jobs in front of you, and then while well, it's printing this, and you can keep uh, submitting jobs. But then it doesn't let you do another one until uh, this one is finished, right? So what does it do? Well, it creates what's called a spool file. So anything you wanted to print to the printer always takes over writes it to a file, and <clears throat> that way, uh, at least it's uh, saved up. And then um, the process can continue, right? So it returns from that uh, printing call. Um, but it hasn't really been printed yet. So uh, the OS could do scheduling, could uh, um, then go, go through the uh, spool, and then uh, get the next one to print, uh, but only one at a time, okay? So the, the, this way uh, it, it achieves the queuing and then um, allows it, the process to uh, continue uh, much earlier than having to wait for the uh, print job to finish. Now device reservation is about um, providing exclusive access to a device. And so this may involve um, a system call for allocation and deallocation of uh, the device. And so there, you can imagine uh, the use of uh, semaphore for this. Uh, but then, it, depending on how many of these uh, you allocate and the order, you may get deadlock. So, so watch out for that. Now, error handling. Uh, so for devices, you find out uh, from oftentimes from the status register, right? You query status register, what's wrong, and then it gives you some error code. Then you know, from there you look up uh, the failure mode. Uh, and then uh, OS, what does it do with these? Well, it has to perform some logging. So uh, a system error uh, gets uh, logged uh, to <coughs> the, the system log, um, and it, it can generate an, a report later. Now, so what do you do uh, as an OS to handle uh, an error? So a couple of things. One is you could retry, and, um, and because uh, especially with hot, uh, plug and play, uh, maybe they just temporarily uh, unplugged it, but maybe it's going to come back, so you could retry and try your luck to see if that works. Um, now, others would then do more and just say, well, I'm going to keep tracking the error pattern to see if it, um, the same error code uh, keeps happening or if the same device keeps failing 
right? And then based on some counter, then you can say, okay, maybe I uh, for now want to stop using a certain device because it does nothing but keeps uh, giving me errors, um, at least for some time, right? and then it comes back and uh, checks it. Okay, it's for IO protection. Um, what could happen would be what could be um, problem. I guess it could be an accident or it could be uh, on purpose. Accident would be more like uh, you have a bug in your program uh, and you don't want it to uh, disrupt uh, the system operation. Uh, whereas uh, if it's uh, purposeful, that is, it's an external attack, maybe involving virus, involving some other thing. Um, that uses the device not as intended, uh, but then, then in that case, you uh, could have um, more to handle. Um, and so OS protects the user program against uh, these illegal I/O instructions. And by making I/O instructions privileged, anytime user code tries to execute an I/O instruction, just going through a system call, then right, that that's handled as. Um, as a privilege violation, so that interrupt mechanism kicks in, always gets control, right? And uh, I.O., uh, so I.O. should be performed by a system call uh, to, uh, so that always can serve the user code instead of uh, just uh, doing its own thing. And um, in addition to I.O. protection, uh, the OS should also protect uh, memory uh, mapped uh, locations. So kernel data structures used include uh, the, the, that uh, status table we saw earlier, right? And also depending on uh, any level of abstraction you build up. So for disk, you oftentimes build up a, a file table, right? So uh, the open file table will keep track of which files are currently open. Okay? And also network connection. There's another data structure uh, just to keep track of the different network connections. Uh, and then how different uh, processes may uh, share network connections. And character IO, uh, character device state. And uh, just like um, memory allocation and disk, uh, oftentimes these buffers need uh, to be marked dirty or clean. Um, and um, so these um, IO information uh, s still needs to be passed between uh, user mode and uh, kernel. And then, um, then, so the kernel needs to keep track of uh, data structures uh, for, uh, for any status update so from the device and also uh, w which stage it is if it's a part of a uh, vector IO. So Unix I/O kernel structure may look like this. Uh, so user process memory. Uh, well, so we'll talk about open uh, file table when we talk about file system. So this, uh, so this example is kind of getting ahead of itself. But yeah, file description that points to uh, the, this per process level uh, open file table, and then there you can have um, a file system record and network socket record. So you say, really? So network uh, is handled as a open file table? Yes, that's how Unix does it. So even though it's networking, uh, it, it reuses this the open file table to keep track of your uh, network and socket records. And so the, that way you can use a file reading writing as a way to perform I.O., uh, especially for the network level. Of course, there's other uh, API for that too, but um, at least uh, Unix uh, does provide this. And uh, the network uh, level would have um, the pointer to network information, pointer to rewrite uh, function, pointer to select function, pointer to ioctal function, close function, and so forth. Right. And then there's an uh, active I know table uh, versus uh, network information table. Okay. So th these are just some of the uh, samples of uh, Unix IO kernel data structure. Now, the topic of power management is put in here um, mainly because it's, uh, I mean, mobiles have become more important. And, uh, OS also uh, has to track the power state uh, as part of the management. So power management by itself is not 
I/O, but it, it actually can be I/O related. Now, there's two ways, or actually at least two ways of saving power. And if you ever read uh, literature on uh, low power design, uh, you can say power on the CPU side, or you can say power on the I/O device side. Okay, CPU side. Uh, the book doesn't really cover this part, but it's called uh, Dynamic Voltage and Frequency Scaling, okay, DBFS. And what that does is, if uh, not needed, you don't have to clock the CPU that fast. You can slow down the clock. And how does that help? Well, by slowing down the clock, you can lower the voltage. And by lowering the voltage, your gain in power is actually quadratic. Okay? So if you cut the voltage to in half, uh, your power consumption is actually one quarter. That's just the way uh, power scales. So why wouldn't you want to keep dropping voltage? Well, at some point it's not going to work. <laughs> it just depends on the device. There's a threshold voltage you, know, you have to deal with. Uh, and also you can't clock too fast if your voltage is low. Right? So, but still, uh, it, it, and also it does things more slowly. But still, if you um, are idling or not doing a heavy load, then it's actually worth it. Not all processors support dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, though, because that does complicate your uh, uh, power supply design. And also, it has to be done in a sequence when you can go up or down in terms of speed. Uh, more common is what's called sprint and halt, and you see that a lot on little microcontrollers. So uh, a lot of microcontrollers, they can do um, sleep mode, and in fact, several different sleep modes. Some may retain registers, some may not. But uh, assuming they uh, will retain state, sprint and halt means you actually can use an instruction to go to sleep and rely on interrupt. It could be time interrupt, could be any other event interrupt to wake up the process. And then that way it can uh, be very, um, very power efficient. Um, and now in terms of I.O. devices, they're outside the CPU, so uh, what can the processor do? Well, um, it might not have a whole lot of knobs. Some may, so disk, for example, some disk, uh, magnetic disks, disks may have spin down or uh, several power modes you can select. But then, um, in general, a lot of these other devices, you're really either turning them on and off or setting into kind of an idle mode versus active mode, right? So, so those all fall under what's called dynamic power management, DPEM. Um, these are targeting external I.O. devices. And so OS would like to support power management at different levels. Uh, one is uh, for, uh, for one computing as a system, um, whether it's mobile, uh, laptop server. Uh, but then power management uh, is becoming an issue even for uh, these servers to our data centers because they, are, they consume a lot of power. Uh, and uh, the saving in the electric bill can be very significant. So now to do this kind of power management, it may even have to uh, also consider just the, the isolation of uh, uh, different processes. Uh, and so oftentimes these cloud uh, servers or cloud computing environment would run some kind of virtual machine. Uh, so that, uh, or, or some kind of container, right? So that way, uh, these, uh, there's isolation between the different uh, machines and or different processes because each process thinks it has all the resources to itself, but in reality, it's just running in a container or a virtual box. And then it can uh, control the, uh, and then shut down the whole system that way. But then if you shut down the whole system, it takes much longer to uh, power back up. So for mobile OSs, uh, it's not just the OS. It has to take advantage of the features uh, supported by the hardware. Or hardware uh, is designed in a way that's more power manageable. Ma manageable. So what usually happens is uh, you manage power at the, what's called component level. And um, in put them into different modes uh, and also you organize them in the form of what's called device trees and so tree would be like uh, you can think of them as almost like a hierarchy uh, between different devices and they are organized 
um, I mean, somewhat like what I was talking about, like um, the say USB uh, organization, you, you don't have just daisy chain, you have a tree. And there's a concept of upstream versus downstream. Upstream will be then go towards the host computer, downstream will be uh, to the end devices. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, OS builds a device tree, and that way uh, it represents a physical device topology. So that might look like you have the system bus, like that PCIe, and then the IOS system. And then from there, it has uh, multiple devices, uh, maybe some on storage, some on uh, uh, display. And, uh, okay, and then the device driver has to track the state of the device use. And it could be either aggressive or it could be um, le less aggressive. A more aggressive one would be then actively trying to uh, turn uh, unused components off. And uh, also, if you have uh, devices in a tree branch that are all unused, then you might want to even turn off that whole branch that way. Uh, because keeping a, a bus active actually consumes power, but then if you can um, uh, say power down or one whole uh, part, then that's helpful. So, what can uh, power management? Uh, what what can always provide in terms of power management? So, uh, there's something called wake lock. So that happens when, say, I'm doing a presentation. Okay, and I want to present from either my laptop or from my mobile. Last thing I want to do is in the middle of presentation, my computer goes to uh, screen saving mode, or uh, right. So if it uh, dims the screen, then that is not good for the presentation. So wake lock says, okay, for this device in this mode, I want to keep it awake. So don't try to shut it down, or don't try to pow low power it, right? And so this uh, kind of thing is um, a. Uh, it will prevent uh, sleep uh, of device when the lock is held. Okay, so um, now another extreme would be to do power collapse, and that means uh, put a device into very deep uh, sleep, and that way it. Uh, so how deep? Well, it's just enough to uh, wake up, because to wake up you actually need the, the device to be uh, um, uh, still powered. Okay, so you don't necessarily completely power down that device, but you, you maybe you want to retain a certain uh, internal state of the device. And that way, uh, it, it, it would be much faster to bring uh, back up and running instead of waiting for the device to reboot. And so um, this could be like the, um, done with a power press. Uh, so, for example, you, on a mobile screen, you can press your power button, and then the, the, after you uh, finish using, instead of waiting for the timeout and then dim the screen, you can just press. Um, okay. So, uh, there's industry standard for uh, doing this, and ACPI is this uh, advanced configuration of power interface. Um, it really is more of like API plus uh, firmware standard, so that kernel can call and manage device power. Okay. And that's supported by a lot of the, uh, um, the newer systems that are um, that know, understand how to do power management. Okay, so the closest to the last couple of topics, um, I.O. request to hardware operation. So how does an I.O. request turn into hardware operation? So there are several steps. One is uh, the OS needs to uh, OS gets the API, right? System call. Uh, it has a query table uh, with a corresponding device, uh, and then uh, check it to see if um, uh, it if the device is uh, the. So you say, for example, you want to do a reading of a file from this core process, right? So you would then query the corresponding device that holds a file and um, check and also you may have to do a uh, translation of name to device representation. OS then uh, would call a driver and the actual physical reading and so that's a read from uh, a disk into buffer. Right? And once that's uh, completed then uh, the, the data then is made available to the requesting process. 
Okay. And uh, then finally, the uh, I/O call returns uh, control to the process. So this is an example of uh, I/O requests in the form of a file uh, type of access for network. It may actually involve reassembling uh, the the packets um, and retrying. Okay. So I think I'm going to stop here. I'll wrap this up uh, next week and I'll go into the next chapter.